Okay, a reminder that this letter is based on a Pusik that says, and David made a name for Hashem. The simple interpretation in the context of the original Pusik means that David made what we would call basically a Kiddush Hashem, sanctified God's name after a certain battle. He allowed the enemy to bury their dead. That's what it's talking about in context. In, in the way the Alter Rebbe uses it uh, as a mechanism for insight, he talks about the name of Hashem, that David, and by extension, each of us, are able to make Hashem's name. Now, we're familiar with these phrases, these terms, Kiddush Hashem, uh, the name of Hashem, and so on. In fact, it's this week's parasha where it speaks about the prohibition of throwing out or, or destroying anything that has Hashem's name on it, Shemois, and so on. So I'm going to scroll down here. You remember this visual, which we've shown you many times. Now, when we take Hashem's name, you see how I made it move like that? The Yud, the He, the Vav, and the He, and the shapes of the letters, the Yud being the smallest letter, the He, having already expanse and, and, um, and breadth and depth. Now, for our letter, we're going to be focusing really on these two letters, the Yud and the He, not so much the Vav and the He. And we're going to talk about it. I just want you to get the visual because I think if you have it in your mind's eye in front of you, it'll be a lot easier than having to refer back to it each time. Now, as we are familiar, the Yud and He themselves are also Hashem's name. Hallelujah, which I'm deliberately now mispronouncing. The Yud and He are already Hashem's name. Now, the difference in this process of Yud and He is best understood when, see, I made it move like that, and that cool? When it's in this um, vertical shape, the yud being the, the origin and the smallness of it, suggesting that it contains the infinity of Hashem, starts to make its way all the way down to us. The hay down here, what is called the final or second hay, is the part of Hashem which is entrusted to us. The yud and hay prior to the vav represent a level of godliness that is ordinarily outside or detached from our relation, the relationship of this world. And when we are able to tap into that level, that is literally taking us, you know, pardon the sort of pun, uh, of out of this world. We're getting outside of the standard human interaction and behavior by reaching all the way up to the yud and the hay. Okay, so you follow this visual. Now, based on this, we're going to talk, we're going to plug it in to a pusik uh, and, and a statement here. Rabbi Yehuda Nesia said to Rabbi Ami, was the literal meaning, this is what so different. What is the difference about that which is written? For in the Lord, the yud hey, and again, remember the yud hey, and not for the Lord or just yud hey. And here is the, uh, this is the Gemara, by the way, Menachas that we talked about. This is the, the the discussion that we're going to be focusing on here, from here down. Okay, so Ravashi responded. It is as Rabbi Yehuda Bar Rabbi Loi taught the verse for in the Lord be Yud Hey, and the Yud Hey being the crucial here. Okay, the Yud Hey is Hashem, an everlasting rock. Lamim, the term to Lamim can also mean Creator of the worlds. The letters Yud and Hey, the concept of be Yud Hey, are referred to the two worlds. That Hashem, bless me, he created one with the Bays, the letter He, and one with the letter Yud. So there's two worlds that are created with this Yud and this He. This will be expanded upon in the letter, but I want to have it as an introduction so I don't have to refer back to it every time. So if you can keep this sort of in your mind's eye, it I think will be helpful as we study the letter. Okay, so back here. Uh, whether this world was created with the letter Yud and the world to come was created with the letter He. Since it says El Tashmaim Behi Bara Matigri Baram Ella Behe Baram Heavy Oimer Oilam Hazab Behe. This world is created with the He because in this world it's more, it's bigger. And again, in our context, bigger is not better because bigger is defined and smaller the letter Yud. And remember, as we pointed out, that every letter shape in the Aleph base begins with the letter Yud. So the letter Yud represents an infinity because when you see the scribe mark down the letter Yud, it could go anywhere in contrast with the letter He. It's like the idea of infinite potential. 
a small child that we don't cut his hair until he's three because when he's small, he could be anything. When it gets to be three, we start to give him direction. But direction means we start eliminating certain options. If he's going to be one, he's not probably going to be the other. You know, we we have to start winnowing out. So this world is created with the hay and olam haba with the yud. And that seems to be, you know, pretty consistent with what we might have anticipated, although we're going to kind of challenge that presumption. Because this world, the godliness is going to be developed, which in the ironic sense is diminished. Because in order for there to be, hey, it's got to be a choice. When it's the letter yod, it could be anything. Once it's the letter hey, it's not going to be an aleph or a base. Meaning here, there's infinite potential. Here, there's decisions that have been made. So there's access, but there's not... Um, uh, uh, unlimited potential. Those choices that have eliminated other choices. So then we go on, we say again, this world here were created with the letter hey, and the world to come must be created with the letter yud. And for what reason was this world created with the letter hey? Because the letter hey, which is open on its bottom, and again, it gives an analogy here, which you can read for yourself on the, on the board. I don't have to read it out loud. So we're going with the premise that this world is created with the letter hey, and the world to come, and again, the world to come means where godliness is evident and clear and laid out before us. Like we talk about heaven, it's not where you get to eat all the cookies you ever wanted, but it's about where godliness is clear, where we have a clear, evident visual of godliness. Okay, so hopefully everyone's got this. I, I email it to everybody, and we'll take it off the share, and we'll go forward in the letter where the author will develop this point. Now, uh, the, we've already mentioned about how the letter sounds are created by forcing the, the undefined breath through the teeth or the tongue. And again, things which hopefully we all do without having to think about it. Chas v'shalom, if a person is challenged with their speech, they need to be more conscientious of how they formulate words and sounds. We hopefully all tend to do it a little uh, naturally or unconsciously without thought. But when we want to really pronounce the words properly, or if you're reading a foreign language and you really need to be attentive to sounds that may not be common and uh, letter combinations and how they change the sounds, you know, the G has a sound, the H has a sound, GH have a whole different sound. So then we become a little bit more conscious of our uh, formulation of the letters and the words. Well, using that as a springboard to help us understand our relationship with Hashem, we have a very similar phenomenon that the infinity of Hashem squeezes through the finite uh, parameters of this world, or, or let me rephrase that. Hashem squeezes through these finite parameters in order to create this world. So we on the receiving end are getting the particular letters and they become an opportunity for us to work backwards to discover that, I'll just use this word, essential uh, letter breath sound that has then been um, uh, uh, where, where the particular creation originates. So in this world, we're starting with the letter A, a lot more structure, which again gives us uh, an entry point, but it also can become a distraction. So uh, again, a classic illustration that we're familiar with, when we have a mitzvah action like shofar blowing and lulav and esrig, this becomes an opportunity for us to become aligned with the infinity of Hashem. Concurrently, it can become a little bit of a distraction. That is, we're so fixated on making the proper sounds with the shofar and, and shaking the lulav and esrig that it's possible that we could forget all about the infinity of Hashem. In contrast, the most stark example that I can think of is Yom Kippur, where there is no action item. There's no thing to do. It's just to be in that moment, which can be challenging. It's one of the reasons why we divest ourselves of our humanity on Yom Kippur so we don't eat and we don't drink and we don't shower and so on because we want to be completely in the raw moment of godliness 
And sometimes, like, that's hard. That's why we say, okay, here's a book. Read this book all day because it'll give you something to concentrate on. Whereas, in essence, we might say that the Yom Kippur, we shouldn't even have davening. We should just sit the whole day and be in our relationship with Hashem. But we're way too fidgety for that. So we said, okay, here's a book. Just read this book all day. And when you finish reading the book, the day will be over. And it will prevent you from thinking about uh, your favorite tomato juice and what the difference is between four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive, which is where our mind tends to wander if we're not uh, uh, grounded in something. So the grounding helps, but it can be a distraction. And that's really what we're trying to avoid. So when we use the the letters and the images of the letters and the sounds of the letters and the, sh the shapes of the letters, which again, hopefully we keep in mind, they become an opportunity for us to have an entry point and uh, a, an access to the infinite. But beware, because we could potentially become distracted by them and in that manner um, disrupted from our relationship with Hashem. So here we go. Achoesius, we are up to what is marked here as the 16th of Av for a leap year. Chitas. Um, in the middle again, we're in letter five. Achoesius, the letters, Hein Bebechinus Chomer, they have a certain material to them. That is, they have very specific sounds that they make and very specific shapes, Vitsura. Hanikro, which is called the Pnimis and the Chitsainus. That is, there is the way in which the letter is manifest, and then there is the essence of what that letter communicates. And as we saw here, every letter has its uh, unique energy. That is, that even though every letter sound is rooted in something that is the very origin of Seichel. Now remember, as we've talked about so many times, when we say Seichel, we don't just mean genius and scholarship or how many pages of the Talmud I've mastered. What we mean is the capacity for identifying the infinite within myself. That is our intellectual process that allows us to come in touch with and to grasp and to um, identify the, um, the, the, the origin of that uh, amorphous essence. That's the kadmus haseichel. That's what drives us in our thought process. The rutzain hanefesh and the rutzain of the soul. Now, again, we have a vulnerability to being uh, distracted by something silly. What's my rutzain is, you know, fancy things, indulgences, etc. But that's not my true rutzain. Our argument is everybody's true rutzain is to be aligned with the infinity of Hashem. Zuhi these are the individuated, particularized shapes uh, that uh, illustrate and enunciate the 22 letters. And this is why, again, as we're familiar, we're so particular with our mezuzahs and Torahs and tefillin that the letters be absolutely perfect, the letter shapes be absolutely identified and there not be any confusion between a chaf and a bays, even though they seem similar, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because each one is a mechanism through which an infinity of Hashem is pressed through the Plato shaper so that that original uh, infinity reaches us in a very particularized fashion so that we can grasp it as it is. And then work our way back to find the original infinity from whence it uh, it started. Aval, uh, however, bechines ha-choymer v'guf ha-his v'asun v'hu bechines chitzoi niseyem hu ha-hevel ha-yetzi mi ha-lev sh'memena mesava kol poshet ha-yetzi mi ha-gore What is expressed to us, what is the chitzoi that is what we um, encounter is the letters themselves and the sounds in which uh, which are pressed out through the throat and so on. So we encounter it at a pretty dimmed level of godliness. The true intensity of godliness is dimmed way down to us 
where we get it. But if we hold on to it, we work backwards. This, it doesn't mention it here in the letter, but this is an illustration or perhaps the, the underlying message as to why there is a value, for example, to simply reciting Tehillim. What is the value of reciting the words of Tehillim if a person doesn't understand them? And the truth is, by extension, all of the written Torah. Why is this important? Just to say the sounds of the words. And our explanation is, yes, while there is a great value, of course, in understanding them, but there's also a value here because we are thus aligning ourselves with the infinite Hashem that is expressed through these letter combinations and words and sentences and so forth. So what happens? We start off just like we experience it ourselves. And again, we hopefully never have to think about it. We have this essential breath that comes through. And based on the way, and again, if you think about like a flute or some other wind instrument, I mean, I don't play music, but there's the same idea. The breath is the same breath. And then by manipulating the holes, it changes the sound. But the breath is essentially indistinguishable because if you took away the trumpet, there would just be the swoosh of the breath. The swoosh of the breath through the trumpet changes the notes, not so much based on the breath. And again, I don't know if this is 100% accurate because I don't play uh, the trumpet, but you get the idea. But by manipulating the holes, that's what changes the sound. The breath is the same infinite breath. Well, on this side of the equation, and again, this is what we always talk about. We just had it in the Parsha where we shouldn't distinguish between mitzvahs because from my perspective, this is a big mitzvah. And from my perspective, this is not such a big mitzvah. But that's because I'm only seeing it on this side of the screen. If I would see the origin, it's all the same origin. It's the same infinite. And then what happens once this indistinguishable breath is forced out, it divides up into 22 shapes and sounds of beat the chafbez oisius and it illustrates in 22 letters in the five different groups of letters and again this is something hopefully we don't ever have to think about but it's explaining to us how the letter sounds come from primarily in groups the different uh, categories or the different aspects of our uh, vocalization Aleph, Ches, He, and I in Mihagur and come from the throat. Svardim are much more particular about these uh, uh, enunciations. Oyin really comes. Aleph really comes. We tend to be a little sloppier. Gimel, Yud, Chaf, Kuf. And again, even doing it now, it's awkward and clumsy because I'm not accustomed to being so conscious of it. They come from the Chech, from the palate, whatever it is, the different groups of letters. And then we get to the letter He. And again, this is really going to be more of our focus because the letter He is part of the creative process. Remember, Yud and He, the first two letters of Hashem's name, are themselves their own name. And again, remember the vertical imagery. The letter Vav is how it's drawn down into this world. And that final He on the bottom is the He of our world. So we live in the final hey world, trying to get to the vav world. But imagine those moments where we can bypass the vav world. We're literally out of this world. We're not dealing with the godliness that is presented within this world, like we often talk about when we define Hashem by what he does in this world. We're actually defining, defining Hashem through our lens. It's like saying my mother makes peanut butter and jelly, which is not untrue and not unimportant, but it's not the entirety. That's the child's view of the mother, like our childish view to say, well, Hashem created the world and he orchestrates the whole world. Of course, that's factual and it's important and it's important to Hashem. But it, that's always defining Hashem only on our side, like thinking that the world began when I was born. So we get to the yud level to reach to that level, which is, again, the whole essence of why the Alter Rebbe wrote Tanya not for the vav hey level as much as for the yud hey level, so that we on this level of the hey should be able to get beyond that sort of dividing point where Hashem comes down into this world, sort of like that blank page of the, or the blank column 
in a Torah scroll before we get to creation, lest we forget that something came before creation. Don't forget. So that's that letter He. Asa Kalila, which is called a light letter. <clears throat> so when Hashem creates this world, He creates it, because remember, this world is created with that letter He. When Hashem creates this world, He creates it with the very light aspect of godliness. Again, so that our common perception or our first interface with God is how God affects me. This is what gives the source for there to be the tangible physical. Because remember, the letter Yud, which precedes the letter A, doesn't yet have any identity. It's the smallest of letters. It has yet to have been shaped and teased and pulled out to create the other letters. Um, it is the letters before they have been divided out into the 22 specifics. And again, once you have those letters, you have the infinite potential to keep uh, re uh, uh, arranging them and re-coordinating them to create more and more and more. That's why we read in that Gemara that this physical world is created with the letter He. It's that first letter He of Yud He, it'd be Yud K, as we deliberately mispronounce it. At Surah Lami, we created the worlds because the letter Yud is the origin, but it's so remote, it's so infinite as to not have any real meaning to us, like telling a child about when his mother was 15. It's it's a factual truth, but it's really not meaningful to them. How could they even imagine it? But if you can walk them through to get to that level of godliness prior to this creation, or not when I say prior, I mean in time, but more profoundly personal, more profoundly essential than creation, now, you, as we say, now you're talking. Now we have really reached to something outside of our life experience. <laughs> Even when we are talking about the lower hay, because the Tanya is anticipating this obvious question. We have established that this world is created from the hay of Malchus, which is what we consider to be the lower hay, right? That's what we always talk about. And now we just said that the Pasuk says, Ki biyud hay, surah lamim, which is a reference to the higher first hay. So which one is it? Is it the second hay? Remember the visual, yud hay, vav hay. And we tend to think of this world as being down on the lower hay. And again, the word lower, the second hay, less evidently godly. And now we point to this pasek, ki bi yud hay tzorei lamin, which is a reference to the higher hay. So hopefully everyone's got this visual. I can put it back on the board, but I think everyone's got it. If not, I can put it back up if you prefer, but I think we got it. So the Alter Rebbe is like, what, what up with that? So the Alter Rebbe's point, as you probably can anticipate already, is going to be that even that lower hay, which appears to be um, so far down the road that it's, it, it's, it's only a distant memory from that original Yud. And even, just to throw in from Igera Sachuv, remember that letter hay is the one that we can take off screen. And we have to Toshuv hay. We have so much control over that level of godliness. It is the godliness that's invested in me. I am capable of taking it to places it doesn't belong. So it's so distant from the infinity of Hashem. We're so far away from that expression of infinity. So how can we, what, what is the connection? Well, the connection is because that hey comes from the vav, which comes from the hey, which comes from the yud. Even within that letter hey, we still have absolute access to the infinite. And this is the constant message of Tanya, that within the crass, remote, tangible, physical, limited, we have access to the origin, the infinite, and so forth. Rizal Darshu Zal Pasek, Ki Biyud Hei. And again, that's the Pusik we saw before, which is a reference to the first one. I know the fee. Why is this? How could it be that we seem to have this contradiction? Remember, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. 
we have this message that the world is created from the least evidently godly. You know, it's, it's somewhat similar, maybe an analogy to the whole perspective on uh, American Jewry around the time after the war. I mean, we would point, or I would point at least, to the time when the Rebbe assumed the leadership. You know, there was not a lot of buying on Frumkite in 1950. People said, forget, it's not going to work in America. There's too many opportunities. You don't have oppression. Judaism had been so defined by anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe for so many centuries that all Jews wanted was their freedom. That was a big push. And again, I'm not blaming them, obviously. That was a big push towards Zionism. We're finally going to have our own country. We're going to be able to do whatever we want. And then, unfortunately, on the other side of all, what are we going to do when we eliminate anti-Semitism? And there was a significant um, population that said, what do you mean? Then we're going to have all the fun that we never got to have because of all the anti-Semitism. They kept us out of the universities. They kept us out of the golf clubs. And now we're going to have all of those things. And of course, the Rebbe and you know others as well came along and said, we're going to, we're going to get rid of anti-Semitism. We're going to build Yiddishkeit. So people said, ah, forget it. It's, it's not happening. The best you can do, maybe, you know, to sort of patronize you. You know, when the people told the previous Rebbe that America is different, they weren't mean people. They were saying, oh, here's a rabbi who's been tortured. Let's make him feel bad. They were trying to let him down easy. Like, don't get your hopes up. You know, we'll buy you a shul. You'll live out your life here. But don't uh, don't get your hopes up. Which was not an unreasonable, unsmart thing to say. Well, this is true in general. You know, and again, where does the Rebbe get the courage to say that we're going to make uh, Yiddishkeit thrive here? Well, it's this point here. Because essentially, you could make that same argument about all of creation. And again, I know I'm rambling here. I apologize. Feel free to get the shepherd's crook out and yank me back on. This is what the angels said to Hashem. What are you giving the Torah to people for? You know, people that the best they'll do is they'll shake a lula from time to time. You know, they're just people. And Hashem is like, no, you don't understand. The, it's the opposite. This is the, the, the goal. The objective is here. And, and we know this, again, I call it culturally, because in Chabad, we're not big into Olam Haba. We're not into, well, when we get to Olam Haba, then we'll finally be able. Meanwhile, we're just sort of treading water here because, you know, we got to sort of keep ourselves occupied. And if we wouldn't have kept on messing up, we would have already had to the opportunity to get out of this world. and just. But, you know, we keep on screwing up. So, okay, so while we're here ready, you know, we'll do some good things. But it's not really here. It's really somewhere else, whether it's really in Yerushalayim or it's really in Olam Haba. It's really somewhere else. It's not really here. This isn't really the real thing. And the Alter Rebbe's pushback, and then again, the Americans, no different pushback is, no, 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 this isn't also, this isn't while well, well, we're here. This is where the goal is. This is the essence. So when we hear the messages like, you know, Mashiach will come and we will miss the days of God, it's like, oh yeah, I double fine, you know. But there is that, that, that level. The idea that this is where the infinity of Hashem is to be found, specifically because it's not overwhelmingly obvious. And that, and to find the godliness, dear Batakhtoidim, in the least naturally aligned spot is to work backwards from the bottom hay to the vav to the higher hay to the yud. Even here, yeah, even here. Okay. Um, it's just a bunch of words here. I mean, it's a lot of words. I just want to cover and then we'll come back. So what happens? Again, the visual. We start off with the Yud, the least uh, tangible, which suggests the most intensely godly. And then it comes down to the letter He. He, remember, is Bina. Next time you go to a bris, you hear the father say to Maimber, Yud, Chachma, He, Bina, Vav, Hamshach, Achulu, right? It's in that Maimber. So again, you imagine this process. Yud, which is the small, uh, any idea, all ideas are welcome, including some goofy ideas and really good ideas. It's infinite. And then it's given some depth and breadth in the level of Bina. So Bina is where it really starts to play out that level of godliness 
that starts to become developed. And then the Vav brings it down to us, and then it's entrusted to us down here, this letter hey, where we go when we do the mitzvahs, which is like the letter hey sound is a very soft sound, right? And the idea of the soft sound of the letter hey is that we do a mitzvah. We don't see the intense godliness. We shake the lulav, we eat the matzah. We don't necessarily experience this mind-blowing godliness, but it's connected to the vav, to the hey, yitzu bitzi spike. Okay. So this is expanding upon the uh, the revelation, Barachovis Hadas, expanding upon it, and it includes in the heart. Then we talked about, you know, take the head to the heart. Don't just remain an academic idea, but the intellect should transform the heart and manifest itself in behavior. That Bina is in the heart. True understanding impacts the character. And from the character, we are then able to express it. Now, again, I don't know anything about music or about song, but when the person truly aligns themselves and it manifests and it comes pouring through and they put their heart into it. You know, we even say this in English. It's really a, a heartfelt. That, that is, there's a certain sense as opposed to a person just reading it like off a ticker tape. There's a, a certain intensity that is, you just can't capture it. There's inflection, there's, um, uh, what's the word, uh, um, cadence, and so forth. That it comes from the intensity that is contained, hidden within the Yud, all the way down to the, um, to the, uh, 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 character, the 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 tangibility of that final letter H, to be able to take the most intense and express it in the most tangible is to go the whole spectrum from top to bottom. Um. So, what happens? We take this intensity of the letter Yud, which represents the full on meaning of godliness, the infinity, trickles down all these processes until it is expressed in the behavioral hey of our mitzvah observance and this is that idea that even though when a person is doing a mitzvah we don't necessarily hear thunder and lightning and the world shakes however it is that illustration of it but here in gullis we don't see it so it feels like it's only a uh, uh, a light letter hey like the le the sound of the letter hey, it doesn't feel very intense, and yet that's what it's doing. It's expressing the infinity of Hashem straight down from top to bottom. Uh, okay, uh, uh, like it, like it. Uh, Shlomo Melech writes in Koheles that the kings speak. So again, the king, the very essence of the king, is manifest in it. As is explained a little bit about the very fabric of the letters of Elokus. Of course, Hashem in his essence doesn't have body or soul. And this is the whole process, the tzimtzum that we've talked about so many times, that takes the infinite Hashem and compresses it into a behavioral is uh, explained at length and short, long, short way. That's Shari Ah, however, we still have not yet answered the essential question. Back to that quote from the Gemara. Why do we say that Olam Haza was created Dafka with the letter He? Again, remember the Kib Yud He, Sor Olamim, with the Yud and He. He creates or he, he he forms or he makes art. We don't have like a verb for art. He arts, if there was such a word, worlds. So we said the Yud creates Olam Haba. Olam Haba is clarity of godliness. 
and the hey creates all of hazeh, unclarity of godliness. So why do we say that this world is created with the letter hey? We have a rule of everyone whose intellect penetrates their heart. We've seen this message before. The intellect penetrates the heart. The abundance of worlds and stages and all of these different processes by which we try to map out creation from the four worlds and the spheroids, all of these terms that Hasidus well, they originate in Kabbalah, and Hasidus helps make tangible for, to us so that we can grasp what we're talking about here. A she'en lehem misbar, which ultimately can't be counted. So they're kind of useful, but they're kind of not. You know, it's like if you use, imagine, you know, you do this, you draw sort of air circles. So it helps you to concentrate and visualize, but ultimately it's just an air circle. It's not truly there. So if you have, numbers, but numbers are infinite, do they really have a value? Because you can never box it in. Well, that's Hashem. Hashem is infinite. Why would we anticipate that it's going to fit into nice, neat little packages? It just doesn't work. It's going to hemorrhage somewhere. But the best we could do. Okay. Uh, like we say, Hayesh Mishpal Gdudov, is there a count to his troops? I mean, there is such a thing. I mean, there is a limited number of blades of grass in the world, but we could never count it. So, it is limited, but it's not uh, knowable. Okay. And within each uh, troop, you have thousands of thousands, innumerable. Point is, you can't count. That That's the main point. And then within each one, you have the levels, again, infinite. Again, these are terms that we've talked about before. Hopefully they're somewhat familiar, but if they're not, they don't have to be distracted by it. The point is, it's way more than we could ever come up with. It's like saying, there is a finite number of stars, but we could never know what it is. So it is practically infinite. And yet there's tangible, because I know what a blade of grass is. I know what a hundred thousand blades of grass is. It's a, it's a lawn or whatever it is. But the fact that I can never know all of grass would be like a child who says, okay, I understand addition. I've now mastered all of math. It, it's, it's, there is a mastery, even though there is an infinity beyond that mastery. So this is what we have to be cautious about. Not to think that Hashem is so infinite that I can never know him. So what's the point? Like I can never know how many grains of sand there are. So there's no point... And concurrently, to understand that even when I do know what some blades of grass are, I should not mistakenly think, okay, now I know everything. Now I've mastered it entirely. So this is what we have to be sensitized to. Um, uh, all of these levels, all of these stages, all of these characters characteristics that we enumerate that exist in the world of Atsiya and Bria and Yitzira. All of this infinity or all of this finity. You know, okay, I know this is going to sound like a joke. This infinite finity, this infinite measure of levels and stages and worlds and, and spheroids and all of this, you know, which is... Uh, identifiable yet not, they all are drawn from those original 22 letters that are in turn drawn from the infinite. So the point being that I cannot know how all the grass, but every blade of grass is an opportunity for the infinity of Hashem. So, there's the endless pursuit of the unattainable, which our Nefesh Bahamas does not like, because we like to know there's a beginning and an end. I want to know when I'm done. And what do I got to do? And then I know that it's set, which, you know, people can live their lives, again, anything out of proportion, in endless pursuit of, I just want to be set. I just want to know that there's not going to be any disruption, which is impossible because the weather changes. Look, you know, one of the things that we're sensitized to with time and the calendars, we don't even know 
when the calendar is going to be. You know, remember, originally, we didn't have a calendar. You don't even know in a month from now, is it going to be a month from now? So that's very disturbing for our Nefesh Bahamas, but it's very encouraging for our Nefesh Kis. Again, the Yom Kippur Marshal. It's a whole day where we don't even think about day. There's no time. There's no conscious awareness. That it, that whole level is just completely obliterated, which is, you know, again, Nadav and Avihu, you think about Aaron's two sons. That's essentially what they said. Who wants to deal with time and get up and go to sleep and three follows two follows one? I don't want to deal with all that. On the other hand, we can become so locked down in all of that that we forget about the infinite. I mean, it, again, every parent runs into this issue. You know, we're so intent on making sure our child goes to school, we forgot that we're getting all impatient with our child. We're so insistent that our child uh, love their Yiddishkeit that they're going to love it no matter what. You know, and we get insane. So it's that combo deal between the, the infinite and the finite, finding the infinite within the finite and remembering that the finite is not finite. Once you master that, it's easy. If you would email me how to do that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, here we go. Commercial cost of a safety yitzira, like it says in the safety yitzira, which we attribute some to Adam Marisha, whatever it is. Shivas avonim boynes chamesha salafim barboyim batim. So you can do the math, but seven stones can be re rearranged to build 5,040 different types of shapes. So again, it's not about the math so much. as The idea is, once you have a critical mass of letters, you can build on forever. You can keep going and going. I mean, look how, you know, the old joke about they were going to shut down the patent office 100 years ago, whatever it is, this idea that we can be infinitely inve inventive. Uh, take it from there. You can't even enunciate it. So it's an infinite number of finite objects, which again, meaning that every finite object is our access point to the infinite. Don't get caught up in the affinity of it, but don't get, don't overlook the affinity of it in pursuit of the infinity. And uh, recognize that the finite is your access point to the infinite. Here we go. Um, Even though there seems to be, there is, <coughs> pardon me, all of these gradations of malachim and so on, that appear to be independent, they all originate in the letter combinations from those same original 22 letters. And it references here uh, a, a process through how letters can be interchanged with each other through at-bash, alif, the first letter, to tough, the last letter, bays, shin, and so on. The idea being, again, even though we're overwhelmed with this infinite amount of affinity, do not be intimidated to think that we can never have any access point. And always remember that the finite, each individual finite is our access point to the infinity of Hashem. Even though it just feels like one blade of grass or one mitzvah, it doesn't have the drama that we often associate with what uh, the infinity is. <laughs> What then is the distinctive characteristic of the angels? Is that <coughs> pardon me? Is that they are embedded in and identified by their awareness of the infinity of Hashem. And this level of awareness drives them to this endless pursuit of the infinite. Ah, however, this physical world, which is lowly, lowly meaning that it's not intuitively aware of its infinite godliness. It's far more aware of itself. With the divine light that exists within it, caught in mihachal, it's tiny, too small to contain it, and to carry that light and life force. So what does the world do? It says, I don't want to deal with it. 
I can't comprehend it. I can't get my arms around it. I get scared, I guess is the word, to get swept up in something infinite where I'm not able to sort of get my parameters, my my bearings. And so I just don't want to deal with the whole thing. It's just overwhelming. It's scary. It's intimidating. So I just say, no, I, ju I just walk away from it because I'm afraid. <clears throat> Uh, from this let the shapes of the letters and the essence that, that drive them and influence them without there being this mechanism of interface, the garments that we can touch and hold and feel. We can't deal with that. I don't know what infinite is, but I know what a lulav is. I know what it means to shake the lulav. That I know. I don't know what this infinite is. The way it is expressed to the malachim. I can't look. That was Sinai, right? Hashem revealed himself, and we were like, well, this is way too much. Just give me an instruction. You know, we're good at that. We're good at following rules, but this infinity, like Yom Kippur, is a little disturbing. I mean, again, my, sort of maybe making it a little sarcastic, but basically that's why we had to come up with the mox. Because we don't know what to do all day. Just sit and be in the infinite. But if you give me a book to read, I know how to do that. I'm very good at that. <clears throat> and it's, a, it's one aspect of it is to basically fill the time so that I'm actively engaged in something per, uh, righteous as opposed to something you know silly that my mind might wander off to. Okay. Um, How does the godliness come to this physical world? It comes through the physical and the, the tangible letters. This is the hot air, the breath that is manifest to us through the seven references of Koheles. That is, in Koheles, Shlomo HaMelech writes, Hevel HaVolim, Hevel HaVolim HaKol Hevel. The word Hevel, is, in that context, is translated often as vanities. But the word Hevel literally means breath. Breath of breaths. So that's three, breath of breaths. Is two. two uh, HaVolim, uh, again, Hevel HaVolim, again, Breath of breaths is five. You know, breath, breaths is two. Hakol Hevel, you get seven. So what is Shlomo Melech saying? What's the difference between five breaths and six breaths and seven breaths? So seven represents the creative process. And what we get is the Hevel. So on the one hand, again, we say, oh, well, that's lousy. Who wants that? But on the other hand, that's the point. When you get a thing, you're locked down to the thing. So we like things. Because we can get our arms around them, but we also know that's it. It's limited to whatever the thing is. So the hevel is the opportunity. And we're like, don't give me no hevel. Just give me a toaster. We don't want this, you know, hevel. We don't want this uh, abstract. We want the physical and the tangible. So, yes, it's true that this world is predicated on uh, a non-physically tangible or visually experiential godliness, unlike the angels. And then we hear people that are constantly in endless pursuit of this, uh, 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 of some tangible expression of godliness. And yet what we are, we are arguing is right. What we have in this world is the, is the entryway to it. If we'll access it. Okay. Uh, that's what the world stands on. What does that mean? Meaning Shoma Malik is saying it, it appears to be a negative, you know, it was just Hevel. You know, I chased everything. I chased wealth. I chased wine. I chased indulgences. It's all waste, waste, waste. You know, and the only thing is Hashem. You know, after everything, just it's all about Hashem. So it's a little bit like Shlomo HaMelech passing on the message to the people. Look, I was, I'm the king. I have every material indulgence and that's all nothing. The only thing that's really important is Hashem. But here, what we're what we're understanding from Shlomo Melch is something more profound. You may see the world as only predicated on Hevel, non-substantive godliness, but this is your opportunity because it's non-substantive to touch the infinite. 
that's the, that that becomes the virtue, not the degradation. It's not the it's not the um, the the flaw of this world. It's the virtue of this world that you can uh, touch the infinity of Hashem because you're not bogged down by the materialism of creation. Um, this is the that which comes from God. That is invested in this world, in all of the things in this world, to give them their life existence. And contained within them is the shapes of the spoken letters. And the thoughts that come from the infinite Hashem. So this is the opportunity to be connected with the infinite. You know, it's sort of the uh, the pushback against that sort of corporate mentality where you're on hold with customer service and there's they're just reading to you from the manual. There's no inf infinite. There's nothing beyond just the rigid uh, procedure, which we create because we just want the toaster to work. So we, we're, we can't, uh, get um, creative beyond that, which is what's it's the destruction of the art of this world. Like I know anything about art, but the idea that there's something more than just the functional. Um, that is absolutely unified with the infinite of Hashem. So when Shlomo HaMelech says the world is built on Hevel, and again, in context, that seems like, oh, that's disappointing. The actual understanding here, the way the Alter Rebbe turns it upside down, is right. You can still reach the Hevel, the non-substantive, the no thing, all of that that we talked about under so many ways. And I understand why people say, you guys are nuts. You know, this is a completely different way of seeing the world than we've always been in, uh, 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 indoctrinated to. We're constantly in pursuit of things. We're never in pursuit of no thing. Nobody wants to be nothing. Nobody wants nothing for their birthday. And essentially, this is what we want. We want no thing. We want to be able to reach that infinite. Um, this is what the Arizal writes. So it sounds like a lot of technical terminology here, but hopefully... We now have a little background so that we can understand. It. So the Arizal writes that the chitzenius of the kalim, remember the kalim, the tools, the pots, the, the, the vessels that capture the godliness, because we need that. We need some sort of tangible hold on. So the expression of them, which appears to be rather shallow. So imagine if you're, you know, just the simplest analogy, you're making food, you have the pot. Nobody wants the pot. You want what's in the pot. But you can't cook the food if you don't have a pot. And it sounds overly simplistic, but it's essentially this point. So the pot becomes our access point. It's like the words that express our feeling. They become the the, the connector between point and point of the malchus of Atsilis. And again, remember, Atsilis is the most aware level of godliness. And malchus, like a king, who makes laws that are outside of himself, the stop sign, again, it's hard for us because we have a different perspective of government, but you imagine the king and he puts up the stop sign. And when you stop at the stop sign, you think, I am now aligning myself with the king or something more important. Again, it's a little hard for us to imagine because we're only interested in the pragmatics. But imagine that I'm doing something, I'm doing a mitzvah. This is what Hashem wants. And I think, well, why would Hashem want me to light a candle. Why is that important? But somehow it is, and I have trust in that, even if I don't understand the overarching all-inclusiveness of it, um, that is alluded to in the in the Shem Hashem, is manifest down here in the world of Asiya. And again, that, that's the point, that here in this physical world, although we are consumed with the very tangible and the physical manifestation of mitzvah behaviors and so forth, this is the access point to the Hevel, that subtlety, that infinity, that drives the entirety of creation. And the king kosbet tikunim shayud hu batzilis vehe tata mikanenis basia. That again, the yud he vav he, again that vertical imagery that one makes it all the way down. Or as we've used the analogy before, the difference between the CEO of Walmart 
and Kmart. They're both geniuses. The difference is how far have they been able to bring their message to the uh, entry-level employee? So that I walk into Walmart and they say, hi, welcome to Walmart. You say, well, that's ridiculous. But, you know, oh, by the way, what aisle are tennis balls in? Whereas in Kmart, I'm running around trying to find somebody and they're like, oh, they don't know what you're talking about. Why the CEO is the same genius. How far down has the image, the vision of the top, the Yud, made it to the bottom, to the head? Down here, us human beings. A person has great mental capacity. And he's able to understand great ideas. And then he compresses it. And we're living through it because now in our society, the last 50 years, geniuses are the people who can make things that work. We want things to work. We're not enamored by, um, uh, abs- what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of academic uh, gymnastics. We are by the guy who can get me, uh, you know, a, a pack of highlighters and a and a power saw to my house in two hours after I ordered it online. That's the genius that makes its way down to the tangible. Um, it's, this is the intensity. You know, we don't celebrate just academ- academia. We only celebrate pragmatism. Because they've taken that genius and manifest it down here. This is the greatest form of tzimtzum, is that Hashem creates this world in six days. The infinity of Hashem squeezed into six days. We're all familiar. Do you really expect me to believe that God created the world in six days? Yeah, it is kind of unbelievable. Why not create the whole world in one moment? I mean, he's God. It's like he has to rest. But this is the point that Hashem is squeezing infinity into six days. Of course, he could have squeezed it into one moment, but then we'd have no access point. Uberuach piv called Tzavam, and with the breath of his mouth, all of these hosts, he ois he shall shame avaya baruch hu asaklila. And again, what we get appears to be this very soft letter. That's it. That's all I got. You know, my parents went to Rome, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. Meaning, I just get something that appears or feels or senses to be very non intensely godly. Like it says, Behei Borum. You remember from the Gemara that we saw earlier? He created them with the hey, the soft letter, because too much godliness, too overwhelming. He mucker hates my mothers. This is the source of the nine creative statements. We always think about 10, the first one being voracious. That is also considered a creative uh, statement, but it, but Bereshit doesn't appear to be a statement, unlike the other ones where God said. It is the basis of all the statements. So it's the same idea. The hay in the behi barum, with the hay he created them, is rooted in the yud, which is beyond expression. Like all nine creative statements, when God said, let there be X, and there was X are sourced in the voracious and something that is beyond it. And that's really what we are searching for. The infinity of Hashem here in this physical world. The Nami Maimur, that voracious is also a statement. He bechines chachma nekras racious. And we know that that is the chachma level. And again, chachma doesn't mean genius. It means the expanded infinite imagination. Hashem creates the world purely spontaneously, not in response to anything. Like the kid who goes over to the new kid and offers friendship, gives him his first opportunity. Hashem creates the world purely of his own volition, not in response to any petition. And therefore, it's in Hashem's capacity, Hashem's imagination. That's that infinity. Simply because God is passionate for doing kindness. And the world is built on chesed. And this is what we find with Avraham and Hebora being the same letters. Remember, Avram's name is initially Avram. Father, leader, 
but he's rum. He's exalted. He's separated. He's looked up to. Oh, there's that great man. But he's a great man. He's over there. He becomes Avraham with the hay, the father of many nations. He brings it down to us. I mean, the distinctive characteristic is not that Avram knew there was one God. It's that he brought this message to the whole world. Behiboram Avraham, the hey means that Avram, who's out there, becomes down here. It becomes invested in this physical world. It takes it from the loftiest down to the lowliest. So now Hashem created the world. He gets the ball rolling. So now Hashem has created a system um, that responds in kind to our requests. That Hashem has now gotten the ball rolling. He gives you like a bonus. And now you got to draw it out through your activity. The chesed that we do motivates Hashem to do chesed. And Hashem's chesed is to express himself to us. Um, that's why the Gemara says, that if a person says, all I have is Torah, which in this essence means that all I have is the academia, which is my pursuit of going outside of this world to be connected with the infinity of Hashem. But he's missing the point of bringing the infinity of Hashem into this world. So not only is he an unpleasant person to be around, because all he thinks about is his own academic ideas, he's missing the point. The point is to bring the godliness down here. To bring the intellect to the heart, to the behavior, to bring the godliness out from within this world. So that's the purpose for which Hashem created the world. That even though... Torah comes from the infinite level of Chachma. And this is what sustains the world. I mean, the law and Bach. That Hashem goes through this whole process of taking Chachma. And again, Chachma is not how many pages of the Talmud you know, but the infinite expanse and compressing it into the very defined physical world, just like the shapes of the letters are very defined. And we're super careful that a chaf and a bays should not be mistaken. And every letter in a Torah should be absolutely individualized and not touching and not bl blended. That is to turn the infinite into the finite so that we access the infinite through the finite, because I know what a chaf is and I know what a bays is, but infinite, I don't know. So what's my access point is the tangible mitzvah expression. Um, that it's not just that we create the world, but we are sustaining it. To do that, it really requires an enormous amount of effort. Again, we're talking about Hashem. We're using uh, human terms, which Hashem allows us to do. Just like to take a very abstract idea and explain it to somebody who doesn't know what you're talking about requires true genius versus geniuses talking to geniuses. How do we do that? How do we propel Hashem? How do we motivate Hashem to draw down this chesed is by acting in a way of chesed. What is that act? When we do the same thing, what happens? A person asks me for tzedakah. So why should I give what's mine to him? And what it's mine, I worked hard for. I, I, I even invested my whole intellect, my whole life, my whole emotion, my kishkas, everything. So it's a total chesed. So the same thing. Hashem is going to give us a chesed. When we are uh, act in in, uh, in a parallel way, possession is what it means. Do not flatter yourself on your wisdom if it's stuck within you, if it's sustained, maintained within you. What then should he praise himself? With the acts of chesed, not just because we like chesed more than we like scholars. Because as long as it remains chachmasoi, it remains trapped. That's interesting. It remains trapped in the head. 
and it's not manifest out in this physical world. Um, because we, the chesed is what draws the chachma out so that it should be manifest in our in this world. And that's what we want from Hashem. We want to draw down the infinity of Hashem. Otherwise, it's my chachma. It's stuck within the person. It doesn't change the world. And again, this is really one of the dividing points between the philosophy of Chabad and what they call the Litvisha world, where their, their whole emphasis is on the Chachma. And our emphasis is on drawing that Chachma down into the physical world. And again, no one's against one, but what is the what where is the emphasis? This is what we mean when we say. There are two types of neshamas, those which are engaged in scholarship. The neshamas bali mitzvahs, and those which are uh, engaged in tzedakah. So you say, well, what do you mean? Everybody has to do everything like we're talking about. It's not like you pick a lane and that's it. Everybody has to be engaged in acts of kindness. Everybody has to study Torah. It's not an either or. So those people who are engaged in Torah study, and again, we're not in any way minimizing the significance of it. They retain their level of God. This is up there. How far down do they draw, do they draw it down? So they draw it down to these different levels of the neshama. The level of Bria, which is where there's Talmud, there's more explanation. The level of Yitzira, which is the level of Mishnah, where there's more uh, distinction, there's more nuance. But down here, till it's going to hit this physical world, which again is the emphasis of Chassidus, of Dir B'tachtainim, and again, this is really one of those basic dividing points um, in philosophy. Again, no one's saying one and not the other, but the where is the emphasis? Is the emphasis on scholarship or is the emphasis on bringing the infinity of Hashem into this physical world? Again, you know, if we win the lottery, a million, billion, zillion dollars, what do we do? Do we all move to Mars and build one big giant study hall? Or do we start making Chabad houses in Saudi Arabia? Meaning, what is the objective? Is it to be in the level of scholarship or is it to be in the level of uh, of transforming this physical world? You know where Chazidus is going to come now. And again, how far down does that godliness get brought? And they're both necessary. Again, it's not one to the exclusion of the other. Don't misunderstand. But we want to bring it down into this physical world. And again, you think about what is the world looking for? So there are some people who are have great admiration for just scholarship, well, in part because, well, don't bother me. <laughs> You know, people say, why are you always coming and ask me to put on the film? Can I just give you some money? You know, don't bother me. So th that will bring it to a certain level. But Sadak is going to change the physical world. And again, I'm, I don't know anything about the ballet. I'm not mocking it. There's a certain attraction to it, but it's always going to remain to an exclusive group, separated out in the theater. It doesn't change the physical world until you change the physical world. And that's the difference between the uh, Bria Yitzira level of Torah study, which is crucial and necessary and absolutely important, and the physical transformation of this world through mitzvah activity. The Bali mitzvah, like it says in Tanya, about how we change the world through the mitzvah actions. They're called supporters of Torah. 
והן בכינס ומדרגס נצח והויד. ליויסה ממשיך עם אורתו למטה ולמסיע. They draw it down to this physical world. Remember the spheres. The first tier is the concept. The second tier is the implementation. Chesed implemented as Netzach, stick to witness. Gevura implemented as Hoid, restraint of self for the glory of Hashem. That's why Tzedakah is an action. Because it brings godliness into this world that we can appreciate in this physical world. Now we understand back to our origin. He made a name for Hashem. Remember, David HaMelech made a name for Hashem. The Zayi says, what makes a name for Hashem? The other that you make it? From the Yud, to the hey, bechinas hadibor, which is speech for rachbi v'sparei, the breath of God's mouth, they lashpila ma'ay lemasia down to this physical world. Derech mosh lahavdi ladol saying cats, mishakasav k'mosha adam einu madab el lachir. Just like a person's speech is worthless, he just talks to himself. We got to get him, you know, some help. Speech is designed to be a form of communication. So Hashem speaks. Hashem says, "Let there be." He's communicating to us. My person doesn't talk to himself. I'm saying that's the compression, which is on the one hand, like diminished. On the other hand, it's that absolute opportunity. Until it is expressed down to us as we can understand. So again, on this side of the equation, we may feel like we're getting something not that all, not all that impressive. And yet, we're getting the most intense level because it was compressed all the way down, just like the genius who's able to create the, the, the functionality or the parent who's able to bring the message down to their child.